In many ways, humans have conquered the natural world. Now, many of us are disconnected from the world that nurtured us. We have forgotten where instincts have come from. The instincts to create, to hunt, and to run. For the vast majority of human history, we were predators as well as prey. Many of our ancestors fell victim to ferocious beasts of all kinds. They shaped our history and ultimately gave us the tools for success. So today we will be talking about prehistoric predators. Instead of generally talking about these predators, we will be looking into specific fossils that show evidence of predation. To understand the human story, we must not solely look at our own species. After all, we have only been around for about 300,000 years, a tenth of the time our genus has been around. Our genus emerged at an estimated 3 million years ago in Africa. Fossil remains of these hominins are very scarce. The oldest fossil actually attributed to our species is dated to 2.8 million years ago. Due to a lack of evidence, it is hard to determine what the lives of these ancestors would have been like. Instead, we can look to other, similar hominids from the same time and place. Australopithecines were common throughout parts of Africa during this time. From just Australopithecus africanus alone, we have the fossils of more than 200 individuals. One of these fossils happens to preserve something horrific. Near the end of the Pleistocene, roughly 2.8 million years ago, a young Australopithecine no more than three years old was killed. Its exact cause of death was unknown until two holes in its eye sockets were analyzed. When comparing the skull to species of monkeys, it became clear that the Tong child was plucked into the sky by an ancient bird of prey. It was discovered among other remains of small animals and eggshells which have been interpreted as a nest. The poor hominid was perhaps fed to the hungry chicks of an African crowned eagle. The young offspring of our ancestors may have occasionally met a similar fate. Adults would have been more or less safe, but I imagine the fear was ever present. The next two specimens we will be talking about come from the species Homo habilis. Homo habilis is the first and most basal member of our genus. They were small-bodied and technologically primitive. And unfortunately for these specimens, they lived in the dangerous Olduvai Gorge. Though dry today, 1.8 million years ago the gorge was a lush region bordered by lakes. Many animals inhabited the region. Some that would be familiar to us, such as elephants, giraffes, antelope, and crocodiles. However, many animals would have appeared strange. Sivatherium, Australopithecines, Dinophilus, and the monstrous Crocodilus anthropophagus. This species of crocodile is estimated to average a meter longer than the largest crocodiles of today. Habilis may have been preyed upon by this beast regularly. Two specimens, OH-8 and OH-35, were preyed upon by crocodiles. What species of croc doesn't really matter. Either way, their fate was grim. Additionally, the remains of OH-35 also had the bite marks of a leopard. Both of these specimens are the left leg of two separate individuals. A leg that was likely pulled into the water by only the most terrifying of predators. Sadly, crocodile attacks are still relatively common throughout the world today. Our next example does not come from our genus, but is still closely related to us. Paranthropus robustus is a species of robust Australopithecine from the early Pleistocene. They were more heavily built than other Australopithecines. They were still quite small, with adults only averaging 1.3 meters tall and only 40 kilograms in weight. Even adults would have been pretty easy prey for medium to large carnivores. Two remains from Swartkran's cave, South Africa, preserve an incredible event. A skull cap of a young Paranthropus robustus prominently features two holes atop its skull. 
in the same deposit, the lower jaw of a leopard was preserved. Amazingly, the lower canines of this jaw fit perfectly into the skull of the young Paranthropus. Since the remains are from the same deposit, it is entirely possible that this was the exact same leopard that preyed upon this Paranthropus. To find the same predator and prey in the same deposit is almost unheard of in the fossil record besides fossils that literally show animals being eaten. These two fossils likely ended up here as a result of a tree over a cave for which both of these individuals ended up in. Both this example as well as the Tong child tell us that young hominids were especially vulnerable to predation. They were weak, slow, uncoordinated, and perhaps more importantly, unwise. Their world was one of fast learning. Failure to do so could result in natural selection doing its thing. It has been proposed that Dinophilus and hunting hyenas were particularly fond of hominin flesh. However, carbon isotope analysis indicates that leopards, Megantarion, and the spotted hyena were more likely to have regularly consumed hominids. From the cases we have mentioned so far, these predators likely ate these hominids simply as a form of sustenance. These hominids likely did not compete all that much with crocs, leopards, or eagles. Though both Australopithecus and Homo habilis ate meat, they were stealing it from other carnivores such as lions, cheetahs, and hyenas. But as our evolution marched on through the Erectus lineage, we would come into direct competition with many other predators. Competition over the same prey, carcasses, and forms of shelter would lead us into direct confrontation with these animals. It was in one of these situations that, for the first time ever, we were not simply the prey, but a rival predator. Understanding how these interactions would have played out is difficult, though fortunately a site in China can provide us with some insight. The Zhoukou Tian site, also known as the Peking Man site, is a cave system in Beijing brimming with fossils. Homo erectus populations occupied this cave from 670,000 to 470,000 years ago. At least 45 different individuals are known from the site, of which 67% show bite marks ascribed to large mammalian carnivores. Particularly, the giant short-faced hyena Pachycrocuta. This beast averaged the weight of 110 kilograms, or 240 pounds, making it around the size of a lioness. A 3D map of the remains at the site suggests that many of the hominids were brought into the cave in different pieces by the hyenas. Many of the bones were extensively gnawed and some pulverized by the powerful jaws of the beasts. Interestingly, the site also contains many stone tools as well as evidence of the use of fire. The site was used by both hyenas and hominids, presumably at different times. Hyenas and Erectus were certainly both competing and at the very least for cave space, and likely for similar prey. Erectus during this time was an efficient predator, but would have also still relied on scavenging. Their lifestyle would have led to many encounters with these horrid animals. As we can see from the evidence, many did fall prey to hyenas. Another cave all the way in Morocco contains similar evidence. A roughly 500,000 year old femur shows evidence that a hyena preyed upon it. The hominin in question is unknown, but likely Hydrobergensis, Bodoensis, or Rhodesiensis, depending on how you want to classify it. Regardless, these two examples are relatively close temporally, but very far geographically. From this, it is fair to conclude that hyenas preyed upon our middle Pleistocene relatives quite frequently. Middle Pleistocene hominins certainly held their weight in terms of survival, but predation would have still been a constant threat. The next hominin we will be talking about are the Neanderthals. There are over 300 individual Neanderthals known in the fossil record, and fortunately for our understanding, plenty of evidence of predation. This is due to the world they lived in. Evidence suggests that Neanderthals developed intense confrontations with large carnivores. 
The first example we will be looking at comes from Cova Negra, Spain. The site was inhabited by Neanderthals during the Middle and Upper Pleistocene and 24 Neanderthal bones have been found there. One of the cranial remains caught researchers' attention specifically because it resembled the skull of the aforementioned SK-54 skull fragment. Further analysis revealed that the punctures were the result of a large carnivore, likely a felid. Remains of leopard were also found in the cave which lines up with the puncture wounds. It is not surprising that we have evidence of Neanderthal predation by a big cat, though it does show that even the relatively advanced Neanderthals may have been targeted as prey. The find comes from a cave which may indicate a fight over shelter, though it is impossible to say. Leopards in particular seem to have been one of the greatest hominid killers throughout prehistory. In the modern day, they are known to hunt humans, chimpanzees, and even gorillas. Our next example comes from Guatari Cave near Rome in Italia. Nine Neanderthals have been found here ranging from 100,000 to 60,000 years old. A skull discovered in the cave was originally thought to be evidence for ritual cannibalism, but recently it was discovered that it was simply the work of hyenas. The cave contained hundreds of bones that had been gnawed on by hyenas. It is thought that most of the Neanderthals had been killed by hyenas and dragged into the cave. Professor of archaeology Mario Folfo said, Neanderthals were prey for these animals. Hyenas hunted them, especially the most vulnerable like sick or elderly individuals. Neanderthals may have lived in the cave at some point, but eventually hyenas took it over until it eventually collapsed around 60,000 years ago. This example is similar to the Joko Dion cave in that it provides evidence of predation by hyenas. A site in France named Les Maustier provides similar evidence. The remains of 65,000 year old teeth show evidence that they were digested by a carnivore, likely a hyena. This example differs from others in that the remains may have been eaten by a hyena after the Neanderthals cannibalized their own kin. Neanderthal bones from the cave have butchery marks on them. Researchers believe that Neanderthals might have cut up an individual and then pieces of the skull were later scavenged by hyenas. The site contains butchery marks on other animals' bones, supporting the idea that it was used as a shelter by the Neanderthals. But just like the other cases before, it seems that the hyenas and the Neanderthals took turns inhabiting the cave. Whether the cave was abandoned by either dweller for the other to take over or a violent encounter occurred, we will never know. What we do know is that Neanderthals and hyenas would have certainly run into each other often, and from our remains it seems to indicate that hyenas may have often gotten the upper hand. It is amazing that hyenas and hominids had such a tumultuous relationship for so long, but we ultimately took the advantage. The last Neanderthal case we will be looking at is quite a crazy one. Several years back, the oldest Neanderthal remains were discovered in Poland. The remains are 115,000 years old, making them the oldest Neanderthal example we have talked about. The small remains once belonged to the hand of a Neanderthal child. The fossils are dotted with dozens of holes that gave researchers insight into their origin. It turns out that this child was eaten by an Ice Age bird. The holes were caused by the digestive tract of the bird that ate it. The child was between 5 to 7 years of age when it was killed. What species of bird digested the bone remains unknown. A large eagle may have attacked it, though it is more likely that it was simply scavenged. Some articles will show a large forest harassed, aka terror bird as the culprit, but this is inaccurate. Forest harassids mainly lived in South America and there is no evidence to support that they were even close to Europe at this time. We have covered Neanderthals extensively, but what about our species? The fossil remains from our species are quite poor early on and the evidence of predation is even less common. However, an interesting skull called the Floresbad skull may provide us with some insight. The skull was discovered in South Africa and is thought to be around 259,000 years old. It represents either a late Homo heidelbergensis or an early Homo sapien. 
The skull has been compared to other specimens such as Jebel Earhood 1, and many have concluded that it represents an early member of our species. Interestingly for our purposes, it has a couple of puncture and scratch marks on it. The skull was found along many prey remains that have been attributed to hyenas. Once again, it seems that hyenas often got the better of ancient hominins. The last predator we will be talking about is ourselves. Controversial evidence suggests that Neanderthals may have been butchered by modern humans. A Neanderthal jawbone shows evidence of butchery that is similar to how Homo sapiens butchered deer. The bone had been cut to remove the flesh, including the tongue, while its teeth had been removed, perhaps to make a necklace. This example is controversial for a few reasons. There are a lot of gray areas. The bone could very well have been cut up by other Neanderthals. Another problem with the evidence is that we do not know if this Neanderthal was hunted, scavenged, or simply cannibalized. This Neanderthal could have lived in a population with both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. When it died, it may have been eaten as was the norm for many populations back then. The evidence could certainly indicate interspecific violence between us and Neanderthals, though it is nowhere near conclusive. Personally, I caution against the notion that we fought a war with Neanderthals or tried to make them go extinct. I often see online and in my comments that it took us thousands of years to battle the Neanderthals and that we eventually won. The problem with this idea is that we coexisted with Neanderthals for many thousands of years in Western Asia. Eventually, when we did move into Europe, our evidence indicates peaceful assimilation rather than a large war. Population numbers at this time were very low. It is thought that there are only ever around 10,000 Neanderthals throughout all of Europe at any given time. Also, evidence indicates that Neanderthals were not all that social. There were certainly not some army of Neanderthals coordinating to fight off the Sapiens. In reality, it seems assimilation may have been relatively peaceful. War is seen by many as human nature, but our evidence for war in the Paleolithic is very sparse. It wasn't until the Neolithic that war and genocide would appear in a significant frequency. Well, we have discussed a handful of cases of predation in prehistory and hopefully got some insight into the lives of our ancestors. The idea for this video actually came from a personal story of mine. Earlier this year, I went on a trip to film some clips in the great state of Montana. We got some great footage on some mountains right outside the entrance of Yellowstone. While in this wild environment, me and my friends wondered if bears were still hibernating or not. Either way, we were probably fine because there are less than a thousand bears throughout the entire Yellowstone National Park. Filming went fine and we only saw some deer and elk. Towards the end of the trip, a few days later, we decided to go on a hike at a trail near our Airbnb. We only went a little over a mile on this trail before turning back and heading home for the evening. We would come to find out around a week later that during that very same day, on that very same trail, a man was unfortunately killed by a grizzly bear. This event reminded me that nature, especially in a place like Montana, is nothing to mess around with. Humans are, and have always been, prey. Well, thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and try not to get eaten by a bear anytime soon. Arrivederci.